Hello, uh, good morning everyone. I'm Mark Woodhouse. I'm an architect with BIM Academy and I'm going to share some of my experiences with you about project collaboration and the tools that we're using um, today. So, oops. to start with a, a, bit, a definition of BIM and a basic introduction to that because it's relevant to collaboration and how we want to use it later on. I'll run through collaboration for Revit, which is the Autodesk tool that we use currently for that. I'm going to say why we need C4R, what the alternatives are, and concerns and benefits. And I'll end with a conclusion for you to take away. So, <coughs> quick definition of BIM and levels of BIM, because this is very, very, very important to understand the relevance of collaboration and how it fits into our industry in terms of delivering buildings and projects for infrastructure. So, I'm sure everybody knows this, but this is a brief definition where we create the digital model. But the key point for me is probably the last sentence, which says, the greater whole life value for the asset, its owners and users. So we're talking about the full building life cycle, not just design, but operationally as well. Um, the digital model leads to lots of information to manage. So increasingly now, there are more and more systems coming online, which help us to do that. But what's driving that is the demand for governments and clients to have greater efficiencies on projects. And to achieve this, I think we need to, to, to include an approach which is collaborative and design delivery is, is adopted as a team through the design process and into the operational phases. Some examples of information management systems are here New form and Navisworks A site, uh, and these are just some of the examples. <coughs> BIM levels is quite important because the industry recognises that to achieve this collaborative nirvana, we have to go through a progressive stage. And I think the the levels adopted are generally well known, which are levels naught to three, and this is the way to move the industry through to the ultimate. BIM level three, which is kind of recognized as the, as the ultimate goal. Uh, but so I'll just go through the concepts of those as well, so you can see what we're, we're dealing with. Level zero is where we were probably <coughs> 10 or 15 years ago, kind of unmanaged 2D CAD, uh, no modeling, no collaboration, mainly for producing paper drawings or, or prints of digital information. Level one, BIM, we're seeing a bit more organization, we're seeing more CAD, CAD management, the CAD standards are being adopted, but there's no real federation and no collaboration. 3D models might be used, but they're just done in isolation by the individual disciplines. Level two, this is where we see, or begin to see collaboration coming in, and that's achieved by adopting protocols and agreed standards that everybody buys into. Uh, but at this point, we're not necessarily working in a shared model. But the key thing is, is here, it's a federated model that has understandable intelligent objects in it, and they can be easily translated even between different pieces of software, um, which the industry adopts. And then level three, as I said before, currently this is the ultimate goal really, which present, represents <coughs> the full collaboration between all disciplines in a single shared project model. And that model is held in a centralized repository. So everybody's working on the same piece of information, real time, and the benefit is that it removes the layer of risk of out of date information or possibly conflicts and inefficiencies in the design process. So again, the key point here is it's is the last sentence here perhaps, which then the model can then be passed to the employer. So you have the life cycle management and an asset information model produced at the end of the 
design process. Okay, so what is collaboration for Revit? C4R. You saw a bit of this before in Carol's presentation. Um, it's essentially two components, which is a plugin for Autodesk Revit, and it comes with 360 Team. Whether you have it already or not, you get that. And the two things go together to produce the collaboration platform. I'm highlighting there also the fact that it, it refers back to the level three BIM, which is producing a, a central model in a centralized repository, which is the key thing here, which you now have the ability to do with C4R. But I think to fully understand the importance of, of where we are now in terms of collaboration and how important C4R is in terms of Revit and BIM, I'm going to do a timeline of collaboration and my experience of that over, over the years, in fact. So I've been lucky enough to work with some large international design firms, and I'm going to use these examples to show you where we were with collaboration before and where we are now. Uh, starting on the top left, in chronological order, we've got Blue Water, which is a project I did in the UK uh, 20 years ago. So we're looking at a 20 year time span here, uh, from 96 up to 16, where we are today. Next elements, you obviously know that one in Hong Kong, is when I came to Hong Kong to work on that project, initially in 2002, I think it was. Then we progressed more recently to, up into Changi Airport, Singapore, which was a Revit-based project. And 2015, we had this Royal Infirmary in, in Dumfries and, and Galloway, which is a UK project again. And then finally, I'll end up with some of the stuff we're doing now on current projects uh, using C4R. So I've laid down a time timeline for you here, the 20 years, and I'm going to use the projects we've done, we've looked at there to see how that fits in. Notionally, there's a scale there for, sh for showing where Revit perhaps introduced, in my experience, into these projects. 2008 was when Revit came in in terms of really using it properly on, on, on all these projects. Before that, we were 2D CAD with a bit of perhaps 3D Studio or, or equivalent digitization is really not part of the design process. And way back, so let's start way back in 96, where we had uh, the Blue Water Project, which at that time, the technology was nowhere near what it is now. We had, uh, we were using 64K ISDN2 lines, which was basically a very small internet connection. And we were attempting, I guess, to do BIM, even though it wasn't really defined at that point. Because let's remember, BIM is not about a piece of software, it's about producing a model, and it's about a process. It can be any number of different pieces of software that can do that, or combine together to do that. So we had, we had, we had a protocol, we had, we had standards, and we used Bovis's system, which I think, because there was nothing else available at the time, uh, they had their own system called Hummingbird. So that was a DIY kind of in-house solution. We carried that further on into Bullring where we, again, we got into project protocols, project standards, we had a common data environment. We wanted a shared model repository, but in a single repository, we couldn't really achieve it because of technology limitations and firewalls and things like that. Um, even when we came to Hong Kong for Elements, we had the same issues. Technology was in its early days. So we had standards, we worked together, we got the team coordinating, but we couldn't really collaborate. Uh, Changi Airport <coughs> was, a, was a bit of a breakthrough really, because we had, we had Revit by then, 2008, we had Revit, and then we were able to operate as a, as a co-located design team. So we had all the design team members working together, so we could share the model. Uh, in terms of Revit, but that was only at the, <coughs> at the file sharing level. It wasn't at the server level or, or cloud even. So finally, we came up to date and we now have collaboration available across the team 
So multiple companies, multiple locations. That's the key thing uh, compared to the previous Shang Airport, for example, where we had multiple companies in a single location or a single company with multiple offices because it was a private network. So connecting two people or two different organizations was is technically possible, but as, as many of you probably know, if you've tried it, it's not easy to get IT departments to work together, especially they're different companies. If I just add in the layer of infrastructure here to explain that a little bit better, I think when Revit comes in, we suddenly get these options for sharing across the LAN, which is work sharing, so we have to be in the same physical building, really, for that to happen on the same network anyway. Then Revit Server lets you join two different organizations together in different locations. But as I say, it's quite difficult because of firewall issues. It works best if you're a, a large company, perhaps, with multiple offices, and then you can control the WAN connection, and you probably have one anyway. So that, that was possible. But the big problem there was latency, and uh, latency is, is the time it takes for data to transmit from one end to another. So Revit server only really works within a, a country, perhaps not too far away, but not certainly not across the world, and it wouldn't work from, say, Hong Kong back to the UK, for example. Um, I think there's a 100 milliseconds is the latency required for Revit to work properly, but from here to Hong Kong is probably 200 plus. So even that, in terms of architectural practice with dispersed design teams, was not an option, so it prevented us working, again, collaboratively. But now we have C4R, which gets around all of that and it enables you to work as a team and collaborate in real time. And I think that's probably, the orange line there is probably the, the place we are at. So that's quite a significant, if you look at the 20 years there, we've been trying for probably, is it 15 years to get there? We nearly got there a few years ago, but now suddenly that, that's really where we are now. So I think we're now at a really important time for the industry because this is technology that is now making this process available to everybody. a reminder there of the key concepts that we're dealing with, which is the shared model in a centralized repository, and 360 and 360 team can, can achieve that. Uh, for those of you who've not seen it yet, this is an echo of what we saw before with Carol, but these are just some screenshots of one of the components is the Revit plugin, <coughs> which you get, which gives you the collaborate tools, and that lets you also communicate with other members of the design team through a kind of social media type chat function. So you can actually really edit in real time and discuss design review can be actually taking place on screen. Uh, again, other people can join in. People without Revit can see this information quite easily through 360 team. You can have Revit installed, like uh, for example, a client or an owner. And that's the other component of, of C4R is the 360 team, which is now BIM 360 team, which gives you models, data, communications, all this sort of information available to everybody from anywhere. Again, more shots from 360 team. <coughs> this is a live project in Hong Kong. Um, viewing capability, which has been around for a while, but it's all, it just shows you how it links together with the C4R plugin. Okay, why do we need C4R? Okay, across the industry, I think it's important to consider these three groups, which are design, build, and operate, perhaps, if you like. So if we take each of those ones individually, there are some reasons to have C4R or why you, want, why you would want to use it and take advantage of it straight away. Uh, we've seen a lot of joint venture partnerships increasingly in, in design, particularly where architects will team up for expertise and there'll be a, there'll be a master architect, a concept architect perhaps, and then a 
somebody providing a, le a level of expertise. So you have immediately have two different companies who need to work together. Now previously that was impossible or difficult, the usual headaches, emailing FTPs and, and uncontrolled data, but now you can collaborate on a, on a web-based product quite easily. Uh, geographically de dispersed teams where you might have them in different countries. Um, an example here would be Ryder, who have multiple offices in Hong Kong, UK, Australia, and quite often are working together on a project that uh, until now couldn't do that effectively or efficiently. Um, another reason for a C4R is a concept designer and delivery architect. This is something you see quite a lot of in Asia, I think, particularly where you have a, an international brand, perhaps MBBJ or somebody like that, working with somebody in Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, some of the smaller developing Southeast nation, nations. They, they really, you need a local delivery partner with it who's got the authority and the legal requirements to deliver. So there's quite a, an important relationship there, which again, previously was not easily achieved, and certainly not with Revit. Once you move into Revit, it's harder to collaborate unless you're joined up, joined up on a network. So another one is multidiscipline approach, which we are, I'm not sure which way around this is, whether it's, whether it's BIM driving this or whether it's the industry, but so I think BIM demands that engineers and MEP and architects all work together more closely, but uh, and contractors for that matter. But we're now seeing this in many more projects where the team or even the clients want to appoint a single consultant who provides all the services under one under one as one point of contact. So immediately you have this collaboration uh, desire, and that's how you can deliver it through C4R. Again, we'll be seeing a lot of that. They don't want separate. They don't want separate silos of information. They don't want separate teams to deal with in terms of disciplines. They want everything together. Final one here is operations. Again, linking back to the lifecycle asset management. This is a, this is a key one for me in terms of efficiency and cost saving. Where you know your your building is not just designed. It then has to be run and operated for 20, 30 more years. And this is where you can use your BIM model to and the data surrounding it to uh, provide the ongoing updates for your team. And if your team changes, then you know they just come into your to your project on the net and, and they have all the information. It, and there's only one point of information now. All the updates you do will be available <coughs> as, a, as a kind of updating model or database. What is the alternative? Well, business as usual was this emailing or FTP transfer, which has its own problems apart from cost and management. There's lack of coordination and it's not real time. And different versions of the same file often occur. So that's a no. Revit server is was a good idea, but it only really works. It's limited by infrastructure, so it won't work across the world. And if you want to just suddenly turn up in a different country and access your model, you don't have you don't have any infrastructure to do it through, so it's impossible. You need a VPN or you need to create somebody needs to create one for you back at base. The biggest one for me is the IT is the IT headache for firewall configurations. For it to truly work across a multidisciplinary team, which is usually different organizations, then you have to join two different companies and networks together. Which um is is either is always difficult and most likely impossible when the two ID T departments don't really want to engage or or agree uh, to do that. So, but it can work, but it, it is difficult to to do that. Very difficult. The other one was hosted servers, another option where you may you may want to get on a DIY hosted route where you sort of you can buy cloud service space and try and do your own version, but it will never have proper integration with Revit and you'll always be updating it. So I don't think DIY in-house is a good idea. So those two, again, not really working. Are there any concerns? 
I've highlighted three here, which is performance and reliability. Uh, service and hosting is generally good, and Autodesk using a, a very good content delivery network, so uptime is virtually 100%. And at Rider, which is the architect we're working with, we've used D4R and BIM 360 now in, in four locations, different countries, Hong Kong, UK, Australia, Philippines, and we found performance to be equally good in all, in all locations with no issues there at all. Service disruption, data av availability, well, data centers have much more backup and much higher technical resources than most end users will usually be able to provide. They're professionally run, that's all they do, 24-7. So I think it's more reliable and generally safer in a data center than at home. But you should always do backups as usual. Normal practice, you need your local backups just in case. Security might be a concern also, but <coughs> there's references to this on Autodesk website where they have what they call a secure cloud, which, which complies with ISO 2000 or 27001. So again, security I think is probably higher and better managed than the end user environment. Um, end users can be prone to have internal fate of, of security or even the loss of data because simply because their budgets are not as high as a freshly run data center with the hardware and resilience really. So some benefits are accessibility, which is a key one, access from anywhere really, uh, overcoming the barriers of all the company firewall issues, no setup required at all. You have to install the C4R plugin, but that's not difficult. Uh, you have mobile access as well to many different devices or the usual ones. And it enables you therefore to have all this multi-firm concurrent authoring of BIM models across any network really. It's totally uh, location free is probably the way to describe it. So that's a tip. Communication, better, better coordinated model, uh, one source of information, ability to use markups, comments as well, which is through the, there is a markup tool, but it's also the communicator feature which lets you talk to each other and discuss design updates or changes. And your non-Revit team members can also access the information and use it and comment on it equally. Cost considerations, there are no, no really big hardware issues or, or setup cost tax. It runs as an OPEX model, which is fairly attractive these days. Software as a service is kind of what it is, I guess. And it's flexible as well, so you can upscale and downscale quite easily. Um, a final thought on this is, I've highlighted here again, this is the UK mandate, but it's generally being adopted now. BIM level two is a standard for being BIM compliant. But the, the key part here is the cost and its collaboration is seen as a way of reducing inefficiencies in the design process and, and eventually the working practices that the government are pushing out will filter through to the private sector and it will be led by clients or building owners and contractors perhaps this time. It's a bit like when CAD took over from the drawing board back in the 90s I think, or Carol said it was the 80s but somewhere around there. Um, but this time I think there's this big financial impact which will be of benefit to the industry. So we like to think cloud-enabled collaboration is, is a real game changer here. That will add momentum to the BIM wave and open up new ways of working for the industry. Thank you for your time today.